you're looking to dive into topics on how to live a happier, healthier, more fit, and long lifespan, then you've come to the right podcast. Living the dream with me, Coach Damian Evans. Together, we will explore the topics on all things health, fitness, and wellness. Together, we will be lifelong learners on this journey to living the ultimate dream. What up, Dream Team? Coach D here coming at you from beautiful, sunny San Diego. And I'm here with our beautiful co-host, Jamie Martinez. What's up, guys? And we're back with some more questions from the Live in the Dream Team. But before we get to those questions, we're going to go over some of our current events and a win and a struggle for us. So what have we been up to? Man, we've been busy. We've been doing a lot of extracurricular events, a couple of concerts, a couple of festivals. We've been... Uh, we did actually did a certification too. So let's let's start from the top. What have we what have we been up to, Jamie? Um, so many things. How about we start with Crossed? So this is a music festival that's down here in San Diego, right downtown, right on the waterfront. It's a beautiful, beautiful venue, and they usually do I think three different Crossed festivals every year. Very low key, more just like house music. Um, but we love it. Yeah, F- Fat Boy Slim was one of the highlights. 60 years old, still up there just getting it on the DJ booth. Uh, yeah, that was probably one of our highlights. He, he was so fun. He was fantastic. Huge, great surprise. Fisher crushed it. Fisher, yep, that was great. So great event, great weather, really pot packed. So, that, I mean, just like usual, a lot of people, a lot of interesting people watching, which is fun. And then we had... Odessa down in Chula Vista uh, used to be called the Sleep Train Amphitheater. Now I don't know what it's called. I don't know either. <laughs> Sleep mattress or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, Odessa was great. If you're a fan of Odessa, you know exactly. Their shows are incredible. Have a drum line, the lights, the special effects, just the music, the vibes, really great. We had our own seats over there and uh, met up with some friends that had... Uh, lawn seats, so that was cool. We took a party bus with our with our buddy Jolin, who was celebrating his birthday and ten years of being at Orange Theory Fitness. So, shout out to Jolin, really great dude, uh, great time, happy birthday to him. And then we did a two day certification course for Animal Flow. That was something a little bit out of our comfort zone. Uh, Animal Flow. If you think mobility meets yoga meets calisthenics, body weight stuff, uh, kind of meets break dancing. Really, really cool. We did uh, the basics of Animal Flow Foundation day one, and then we put it together in a flow for day two. Maddie was our instructor. Shout out to Maddie. She rocked it. Um, just a really cool crew. We had people all over the world coming. So from China, uh, our our flow partner, Song from China, he he was a genius. I mean, he spoke great English. He uh, he understood the moves really well. He was great. And then there was a guy from France, Roger. Uh, and we even had a fire dancer with us. She was great. Christina, shout out to her. Um, so yeah, overall animal flow. Now we just have to send in a video of us flowing in order for us to get certified. So pumped on that. Yeah, it was crazy. Seven hours, two days. It was a lot. Definitely challenging mentally and physically. It was. It's crazy how tough a body weight movement can be when you're holding it, just holding yourself up. Um, and yeah, at the end, we had to get into little groups and then write your own flow and perform it. And Damien was the one calling out all the different moves, telling us what to do um, while I was flowing with song. And he filmed it, but he missed me. I swear I did it, but he just got my leg. <laughs> yeah, put, put the camera on a tripod and just just cut her out of the frame. Did not do that intentionally. So we don't really have anything to prove for, for all the work that we put in. But we'll film us doing our flow for the certification, and then we can post that or something. Uh And at our studio, we've added some new uh, special classes for our members, which we've been really excited about. We just did our very first Yen Yoga Restorative Deep Stretch class, which it was packed. Not really any space left for any yoga mats. Uh, Really, really excited to bring Yen Yoga to our new community. It's something that Jamie and I have been doing. Uh, We try to do it every night, and it helps us so much with our sleep quality, sleep quantity. It helps us to downregulate the nervous system and get ready for a better night's sleep. 
Um, so we're going to be doing that once a week for now and then slowly adding it on. If you don't know about Yen Yoga, deep stretch holds, lots of focus on the breath. Uh, great, great, great way to finish the night. And then we added some clinics too. So we're going to be bringing so much value to our new gym. We've just been on the grind of just trying to offer value. We have a posture clinic coming up. We have a squat clinic coming up. So just ways for our members to be able to uh, just learn more about their bodies and, and be uh, prepared for all the stuff that we throw at them when they come into the workout room. So that's kind of what we've been up to. And let's go on to our wins and our struggles of the week. Wins and struggles. What do you got, Jamie? I'd say my win is I'm finally feeling like I'm getting back on track. Um, I think I said this last time where fully taking advantage of summer and yes, we have been doing a lot of things very, very busy, um, but I've been trying to make it a focus to break my habit of having that glass of wine in my hand every night that I'm cooking dinner. So just cutting back on the alcohol a little bit and sticking to my three days a week. Yes, I know that is still frequent, but it's better from what it used to be. So I'm just feeling good in that space and I'm just really trying to get back on my workouts um, and focusing on strength. So I'm just feeling, I'm feeling strong again, which is nice. Um, I would say my struggle, um, because we have been doing so many things still, we're just been very busy and working a bunch. Um, I feel like my sleep hasn't been the best. I hate to say this, but it's like I'm becoming a morning person because I have to open at least once a week and I've just been at the studio more often in the morning than not. Um, so just hoping to find that new flow of the new routine and getting back on track with good quality sleep. Yeah, that's always a challenge when you have a couple days a week where you wake up early and a couple days a week where you can sleep in and sometimes you coach at night, sometimes you coach in the morning. Like that's that's a challenge to be able to have the body find its own ry rhythm and, and be able to, you know, get that routine down in order for the body to know what's happening. So hopefully we can get that a little more standardized the more that we move into this um, new schedule with the new gym. And maybe we can try to get a better schedule with new coaches coming on and helping us out with that. So, yeah, my win is even with all the extracurricular stuff going on, feeling caught up with everything that I need to do. I feel like I've been diving into some big projects that are going to be helping the, the members of the gym and and not feeling overwhelmed with that. I thought I might get sick it, from staying up a little bit late at these concerts and not getting enough sleep, but I'm feeling healthy, so I've, I'm definitely going to consider that a win. Uh, struggles are, my calories are definitely dropping. I've been trying to gain weight, gain muscle mass, and I've just been stagnant for a long time. And uh, I think it's because my grocery shopping routine is off, so I haven't really been loading up the kitchen and the and the cupboards with all the food that I need to be able to keep that calorie surplus and I just haven't really put a mo much of a focus on it so um, just being aware of that protein level is probably high enough I'm still getting probably over 150 to 180 grams of protein every day probably up into the 200 grams of protein honestly but just the ca overall calories need to be high in order for that surplus just like if I was looking to lose weight I would want that calorie amount to be lower than my expenditure with that protein intake so my struggle is that I'm going to try to go for a big Costco run here this next week and reload re-up and we should be good to go Nice. Let's move on to the questions of the day. Before we do, I just want to remind everyone that we do a weekly newsletter here at the Live in the Dream podcast. That weekly newsletter has all things health, fitness, wellness. It's got nutrition recipes. It's got direct links to episodes, podcasts, audiobooks, things that I've been listening to and learning from and uh, YouTube videos that I think you could uh, benefit from. So if that's something that you would be interested in subscribing to the newsletter, just send me a DM at coach Damien underscore SD or at live in the dream underscore podcast. And I can get you added to that newsletter mailing list. All right. First question of the day. We have three of them, one on lifestyle, one on movement and exercise, and one on nutrition. What do we got for question number one, lifestyle? Question number one, I'm a female in my mid thirties and I'm averaging 1,500 calories a day, average 60 grams of protein, and I'm doing something active six out of seven days a week. Four out of six are cardio-focused. My body isn't really responding like it used to, and I'm not seeing the results that I want. I want to lose body fat and gain more lean muscle. Not sure what to do next. Any advice? 
<sighs> okay, so I am going to be very thorough in the way that I answer this question because this is a very, very common uh, question that we get all the time. And it's time. usually just like this. It's, I'm eating this many calories. I'm doing all of this activity. I'm probably eating just uh, this much protein and I just can't get the results that I used to be getting. It used to get me here and it just isn't getting me that anymore. So going to be very thorough here. I really appreciate this person's dedication to maintaining an active lifestyle. Six days a week of exercise, crushing it um, and watching calorie intake so they know how many calories they're intaking, they know how much protein they're intaking. That's a great start. And it's frustrating when you don't see the results that you want, but there are several factors that could be contributing to this person's plateau. So we're going to offer some tips, some advice, some education on how to help break through and achieve the fat loss goal that this person is looking for, the lean body goals that they're looking for. And we're going to do this based on three different things that I'm reading in this question. The three things that I'm reading in this question that I want to address are number one, the calories, number two, the macros, and number three, the training selection. So let's go through them. Number one, Reevaluate your caloric intake. While 1,500 calories per day might seem like a reasonable target for fat loss, it's really important to make sure that you're eating enough calories and not eating too few calories. Consuming too few calories can slow down your metabolism and hinder your fat loss. We're going to go into much more depth on that. Consider consulting with a registered dietitian here if you need to to determine the appropriate calorie range for your goals and activity level because you know, just going online and finding that calculator doesn't always do the best job. Let's go over the basics of metabolism because metabolism, the word is just thrown out there so often, but do you really know what metabolism means? What metabolism consists of? Could you explain it to a five-year-old? Well, the basics of the metabolism is metabolism refers to all of the chemical processes that occur within your body to maintain your life. It includes various functions such as breaking down the food that you eat for energy, which is called catabolism, and building and repairing your tissues from those building blocks, which is called anabolism, catabolism and anabolism. Your total daily energy expenditure, your TDEE, is the number of calories that your body needs to perform all of these functions and maintain your current weight, maintenance. We talk about if you don't eat enough calories, you go into what's called starvation mode. What is this starvation mode that everyone talks about? The starvation response is when you consistently consume too few calories over time and your body may enter this often referred to state as starvation mode, but more scientifically known as the metabolic adaptive thermogenesis response. Whoa, metabolic adaptive thermogenesis. Metabolic meaning your metabolism and all the metabolic processes that happen. Adaptive meaning that you adapt to this low calorie state. And thermogenesis is the creation of heat, temperature, metabolic adaptive thermogenesis. This is a survival mechanism that has evolved over millions of years to help humans and other animals survive periods of food where it is scarce. Now, how does it work? Reduced energy expenditure happens when you eat too few calories. In response to a prolonged calorie deficit, your body is gonna try to conserve energy by slowing down certain processes. This includes reducing the rate at which you burn calories at rest, also known as your basal metabolic rate, your BMR. Your BMR accounts for the majority of the calories that you burn daily, even when you're at rest. Over half of the calories that you burn are from your BMR. When your body experiences a calorie deficit for an extended period of time, it can initiate various physiological adaptations to reduce energy expenditure and to conserve resources. Here are some specific ways that your body does this. Reduced BMR, which again is the amount of calories that you burn just to keep you alive. Things such as breathing, circulating blood, maintaining your body temperature in response to a calorie deficit, your body is going to lower the amount of energy that it puts to these processes. And this means that you burn fewer calories at rest, making it more challenging to lose weight. Decreased thermogenesis. There's that word again, thermogenesis. Your body generates heat through a process called thermogenesis, which contributes to overall calorie expenditure. When you're in a calorie deficit, your body 
may reduce what's called non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is what we used to what we refer to as NEAT on this podcast. Your NEAT includes activities like fidgeting, maintaining your posture, being very animated and talking with your hands and your body, and other small daily movements that can result in fewer calories burned throughout the day when this NEAT gets turned down. And I know Jamie has seen this firsthand because she started eating a ton more calories than she was used to, and her body just started putting off all this heat. She got really hot at night. Her body would just feel warm all the time. This was the body adapting to the excess food intake that she was intaking, and it was ramping up those processes, and it was making her body a more calorie, a more um, non-efficient calorie-burning machine. You guys, truth. I am still on fire all the time. Not on fire, but I am warm. I am projecting heat. My body is just burning it. So your body can ramp up or down that process based on the amount of calories that it's coming in. Another way is muscle loss. To meet the body's energy needs, your body is going to start breaking down muscle tissue if you don't give it the fuel it needs and it is required to do the activities that you're asking it to do. Muscle requires more energy to maintain than fat. So losing muscle mass reduces your overall calorie expenditure, which is a good thing if your body feels like it's not getting enough calories. This is why maintaining muscle through strength training is going to be crucial during your fat loss or your weight loss phases. Other things that are being a little more researched right now are hormonal changes. A lot of people put too much importance on these hormones and really use it as a, a, a crutch saying that, oh, it's just my hormones, so I have, there's nothing I can do about it. Let me go take these medications. But it doesn't mean that hormones don't play a part, just that they shouldn't have such a big role. And even if they do have a big role, you can't put all of your eggs in that basket because you are now giving away your control. But I do want to touch on a few of the hormones that are affected when you go into a calorie deficit. You have leptin, you have thyroid hormones like T3 and T4, you have cortisol, and you have ghrelin. So low-calorie diets can disrupt hormonal balance, particularly hormones like the ones that I just listed. These hormones play a role in regulating hunger, in your metabolism, and your energy expenditure. Reduced leptin levels can increase your appetite, making it harder to stick to a low-calorie diet because you just get more hungry and more hungry Hormonal changes can play a significant role in slowing your, down your metabolism and hindering fat loss when you're in that prolonged calorie deficit, not eating enough calories. And leptin, leptin's effect on metabolism, it lowers your leptin levels when you're in a calorie deficit, and this can signal to your body that you're in a state of energy scarcity, potentially leading to a reduction in your metabolic rate, your BMR. This is going to slow down your metabolism and make it harder for you to lose weight. Leptin's impact on fat loss, well, reduced levels of leptin can increase appetite, especially for calorie-dense and high-carbohydrate foods. So you may experience stronger cravings and find it more challenging to stick to a diet when you have these reduced levels of leptin when you're in that calorie deficit. Your thyroid hormones, these, specifically T3 and T4, are critical for regulating your metabolism. They influence the rate at which your body burns calories, how your body utilizes energy, and how it manages your body temperature. Cortisol. Cortisol is often referred to as the stress hormone because its levels rise in response to stress, but it is very important in a lot of other things. Uh, you know, it includes things like chronic stress, yes, such as calorie restriction and intense exercise. But cortisol has a huge effect on your metabolism. Elevated cortisol levels can lead to an increased muscle breakdown, which is going to then reduce your muscle mass. As mentioned earlier, muscle burns more calories at rest than fat does, so losing your muscle is going to slow down your metabolism. And then that impact on your fat loss, when you have high levels of cortisol, it's going to promote fat storage in the abdomen region, your abs, your belly, your visceral fat right there where the organs are, this is going to be associated with a ton of various health risks. And then ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hormone produced in the stomach that stimulates hunger. It tends to increase before meals and decrease after eating. Ghrelin is going to have a huge effect on your metabolism when you're in a calorie deficit, 
Ghrelin levels may rise, leading to increased feelings of hunger and making it more challenging to maintain a calorie-restricted diet. And ghrelin's impact on fat loss, elevated ghrelin levels can lead to increased food cravings and potentially result in overeating, which can hinder your fat loss goals. So yes, these hormone changes are adaptive responses to perceived energy scarcity, and they can collectively slow down your metabolism, make it more difficult to lose fat when you're in a calorie deficit. So to mitigate these effects, it's crucial to approach fat loss in a balanced and gradual manner. Prioritize your nutrient-dense foods, which are going to keep you fuller and give you all the micronutrients you need. It's going to help you maintain your muscle mass through strength training and protein. And then you can also assist with managing your stress levels through techniques such as relaxation and mindfulness practices. Other ways that this is going to affect your body is when you're in a calorie deficit, you have slowed digestion. Your body may slow down the digestion and absorption of food to extract as many nutrients and calories as possible from the limited food intake. While this might seem like a positive adaptation, it can also lead to constipation and intestinal discomfort. You may also experience lowered energy for physical activity. When you're in a calorie deficit, you may feel fatigued and have reduced energy for physical activities, including exercise. This can lead to a decrease in the number of calories burned during your workouts. And then you might even adapt to the exercise that you're doing. Adaptive exercise efficiency means that over time, your body can become more efficient at performing the same exercises that you do frequently, burning fewer calories for the same workout intensity. This is known as exercise adaptation. And so all of these adaptations are the body's way of preserving energy and ensuring survival during times of food scarcity. While they may be advantageous from a evolutionary perspective, they can make it more challenging to lose fat and maintain a healthy weight when you're intentionally restricting calories. This is why it's important to approach weight loss with a balanced, sustainable, and gradual approach making sure that your calorie deficit is not too aggressive, along with a focus on maintaining muscle mass through strength training and overall nutrition adequacy. So let's go over the consequences of starvation response or metabolic adaptive thermogenesis, eating too few calories and what that can have as far as your negative consequences. Number one, slower weight loss. Number two, muscle loss. Number three, fatigue and weakness. And number four, nutritional deficiencies. Those are all things that can happen when you eat too few calories. So what is that solid solution? It's the balance approach. The key to a successful and sustainable fat loss is finding the right balance between calorie intake and expenditure and creating just a moderate calorie deficit rather than an extreme one, which is generally gonna be more effective for your long-term success. This is gonna allow you to lose weight lose fat while minimizing the negative effects on your metabolism and your overall health. So again, it might seem counterintuitive. Consuming too few calories can slow down your metabolism and your non-exercise activity, your fidgeting, your desire to take that extra trip when you forgot something, uh, your random desires to go out for a walk or to clean the house. And eventually this downshift in energy is going to hinder your fat loss in the long run due to this adaptive response that your body undergoes to conserve its energy. It's so important to aim for a moderate and sustainable calorie deficit and prioritize that balanced diet to support your fitness goals while maintaining overall health. So that leads us into the second thing that I want to talk about. First thing was reevaluating your calories. Second one is balancing your macros, your macronutrients carbs, proteins, and fats. Protein, it's essential for muscle preservation and we talk about it all the time, but it's also important to pay attention to your carbs and your fats. A balanced diet that includes a good mix of carbs, healthy fats, and protein is gonna be a key, key to supporting your energy levels and metabolism. I, guess I get asked all the time how to balance macronutrients and it is so, so individualized, but for those that could use just a general recommendation to start, if you consume 2,000 calories a day, a balanced macronutrient breakdown might look like this. If you eat 2,000 calories, then maybe your protein is between 15 and 25% of those total calories. That would equal about 75 to 125 grams. 
that would be a good starting point for someone that weighs anywhere between 100 and 125 pounds. Now, carbohydrates, that could be anywhere between 45 and 65% of your total calories, meaning that you could eat 225 grams to 325 grams. And dietary fats could be anywhere between 20 and 35% of your total calories. You could start at 44 grams of fat, which I think is a little low, up to 77 grams of fat. For a person that's around 100 and 125 pounds, that's not too bad at all. Yeah, along the line of fats, we actually both realize that we eat a bunch of fat in our diet, not on purpose or anything. It's just how our bodies feel really good. Um, and this is something that I look at with a few of my clients when we get to a certain point where we can dive into their macros. Usually we start with just the protein, but a little tip, the higher the stress my client typically has, I then prescribe them to consume a little bit more healthy fats to help balance um, their hormones on the back end. Yeah, that's well, a huge high percentage of our diet is fat, healthy fats. Um, so protein, protein, we say shoot for one gram of protein per pound of body weight for your body composition goals. Uh, examples of protein sources, lean meats like chicken, turkey, lean cuts of beef or pork, fish, fatty fish, salmon, tuna, tilapia, dairy, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, that kind of stuff. And then plant-based sources of protein, tofu, tempeh, edamame, legumes, quinoa, that kind of stuff. We're looking for at least one gram of protein per pound of body weight if we're looking for those body composition goals as a gold standard goal to shoot for. Uh, carbohydrates. When you're aiming for 45 to 65% of your daily caloric intake from carbohydrates, you primarily want to focus on complex carbohydrates like whole grains, fruits, vegetables. Technically, carbohydrates are not an essential macronutrient. You can survive without them, but can you thrive? If you do any sort of training at all, and you should definitely be doing some form of training, then you're going to want to have carbohydrates in your diet to fuel for that activity. Carbohydrates are your body's primary source of energy. They are important for fueling your workouts and for your brain function. And the recommended daily intake here varies but you're going to focus on things like whole grains, oats, brown rice, quinoa, fruits, berries are going to be amazing here, apples, bananas, uh, vegetables, leafy greens, sweet potatoes, broccoli, legumes, beans and lentils, and dairy, so milk, yogurt, if you can handle it. Carbohydrates are great for those People that like group fitness classes, those high intensity efforts, if you're going to do any form of sprinting, jumping, any form of uh, exercise to get your heart rate up into that, those higher zone four, zone five zones, definitely want to focus on fueling with carbohydrates and not avoiding carbohydrates altogether. And then dietary fats, aim for 20 to 35% of your diet in dietary fats. These are going to be essential for hormone production, absorption of fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K, and just your overall health. Avocados, nuts and seeds, fatty fish, olive oil, nut butters, coconut, and even a little bit of dark chocolate. A little piece every night is what we enjoy at our house, so uh, just make sure that it's over 75% cacao or higher. Um, other interesting facts about macronutrients, not all carbohydrates are created equal. If you focus on the complex carbohydrates found in whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, you're going to have more sustained energy and you'll probably have better nutrient density. Avoid simple ultra-processed carbohydrates like cereals, added sugars, chips, cookies, sodas, muffins, the kind of stuff that just digests so fast and puts a sugar bomb straight into your system. And then fiber, fiber is also super important. Found in carbohydrates like whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, it's essential for your digestive health and for your satiety, how full you are. It's important for your blood sugar control. Shoot for about 15 grams of fiber for every 1,000 calories that you eat. If you eat 1,000 calories, 15 grams. If you eat 2,000 calories, 30 grams, so on and so forth. That should be the minimum. So number two that this person should focus on is their 
macronutrient being balanced. Number one was to focus and reevaluating their calories. And number three is going to be all about their training. Right now, this person is doing way too much cardio for their goal. They've adapted to it. They've probably hurt their metabolism by breaking down that muscle mass. So number three, strength training. Incorporate strength training into this routine. Switch the ratio between four cardios and two uh, full bodies, which their full bodies probably is going to be a group fitness class that's high intensity and probably counts more towards cardio than it does resistance training. And shift that to three to four days of strength training and a couple days of cardio or group fitness classes. Muscle burns more calories at rest than fat. So increasing your muscle mass is going to aid in fat loss. Aim for at least two to three days of strength training per week. Why is it essential to do this to achieve their goals? Because strength training is essential for several reasons. Muscle preservation. During weight loss, and if this person's going to be in a calorie deficit, the body tends to break down both fat and muscle for energy. Strength training is going to help preserve and build lean muscle mass, ensuring that you're losing primarily body fat. It's going to give you a me metabolic boost. Muscle burns more calories at rest than fat. By increasing your muscle mass through strength training, you can elevate your resting metabolic rate, your BMR, making it easier to maintain a healthy weight. Body composition, strength training can help you achieve a leaner, more toned appearance by shaping and defining your muscles as you chip away at that body fat. And just functional strength, it improves your overall strength and functional fitness, making daily activities easier and more desirable, and it's going to help reduce your risk of injury. How does strength impact this person's goal? Strength is going to be a crucial factor in achieving the goal for losing fat and becoming more lean because muscle tissue is metabolically active. The more muscle you have, the more calories you burn. Fat utilization Strength training enhances your body's ability to use fat for energy, making it a valuable tool for fat loss, and it helps reshape the body by reducing body fat percentage and increasing muscle definition. What else is strength training going to do for this person? It's going to help improve their bone health and density. It's going to help improve, enhance their functional fitness, making them a more well-rounded, strong athlete in everyday life. It's going to give better confidence in themselves. It's going to give them better posture, which has so many effects, even psychological, and it's going to help with injury prevention so that they can stay long-term sustainable with their activities. The best strategies for incorporating strength training into daily lifestyle are to set clear goals, define what your goal is. If it's increasing muscle mass, improving strength in a certain lift, or enhancing your physique in a certain way, get a clear goal, and then plan your workout based on that goal. And if you need a professional to help you with that, that is where that comes in big time. And then consistency, huge aim for at least two to three days a week of strength training per week and stick to that routine for a long time. Make sure that you're consistent because it's going to take time. And then progressive overload. You have to remember to gradually increase the resistance of each exercise or the intensity of each workout so that you continue to challenge the muscles to grow. Proper form is going to be important here. Ensuring that you have proper form is going to prevent injuries and maximize the effectiveness and, and a, and a mind muscle connection to each movement is super important, which takes time and practice and, and skill and then rest and recovery, allow the muscles to recover from the damage that you put on them with adequate amount of time without resting too long. You want to find that sweet spot to where you're ready to train again and you don't let it go too long without training that muscle group. Balanced nutrition is going to be a huge factor here. If you go through all the things that we talked about prior with that protein and with that calorie amount being a slight calorie deficit, you should be good to go here. I'm going to list a few other things that you could look at, but those are going to be my top three. Uh, other things that you could look at is varying your cardio workouts. If you love cardio, if it's something that you just can't not do, vary the cardio up. Incorporate sprinting. Meet yourself where you're at. Incorporate the high intensity, very, very short bouts of effort once a week to start. You can incorporate rucking by putting weight on your back instead of doing longer cardio. You could do shorter amounts of cardio with an increased load. 
You could practice zone two cardio, walking on the beach, walking around the forest, uh, going into a, a state of exercise intensity where you could hold a conversation, but you don't want to, and doing that for prolonged periods of time. And then just focusing on your walking or your daily steps and just give yourself a goal to increase that rather than just doing another cardio session each week. Another thing you could do is track your progress. A lot of times when you think you're doing something and you're not tracking it, you're just a little off on what you're actually doing. So track. Consistency and patience is going to be important. Plateaus are super common, but it's essential to stay consistent with your nutrition and your exercise routine and just be patient. Results take time. So maybe you just have not been working in the, in the way that you think you are for long enough. Hydration and sleep, don't overlook the importance of proper hydration, and we all know the importance of quality sleep. These factors play a significant role in your body's ability to recover and burn fat efficiently. And then, of course, as always, consult a professional. If you're struggling like this and you're just super frustrated, go get help from a registered dietitian, a health and fitness coach, a personal trainer. Remember that every individual is unique, and what works for one person may not work exactly for the same uh, at, for another person, no matter what the book of your favorite guru says, or no matter what uh, the YouTube channel guy says, it's essential to listen to your own body and make adjustments when necessary and stay committed to your health and fitness goals. So I know that was a very thorough answer, but I think it's important. Let's move on to question number two, exercise and fitness. Question number two, how do I get better at box jumps? Ah, I like this one. So this is like one of the things that I have been blessed with and I worked really hard at. I can't lift very heavy with these chicken legs, but I can jump pretty high. Um, and it started from an investment in the skill when I was younger. So let's talk about box jumps in particular. Box jump exercises are a popular and effective workout that can provide numerous benefits for both beginners and advanced athletes. These exercises involve jumping onto and off of a raised platform or a box, typically with both feet. They can be performed as part of a larger workout routine or as a standalone exercise itself. One of the primary benefits of box jumps is improved lower body strength and power. The act of jumping and landing on a box requires the use of muscles in the legs, glutes, core, and can help to improve overall strength and explosive power in your full body. This can be especially beneficial for athletes or individuals who participate in sports that require quick bursts of speed or power, such as basketball or football. But it doesn't have to just be for athletes. Box jumps exercise can also provide some cardiovascular benefits. The act of jumping and landing on a box is a high intensity plyometric movement that can elevate the heart rate and improve cardiovascular fitness. And this can be especially beneficial for those looking to improve their endurance and overall fitness levels. But we'll talk about why some people may do this at a detriment uh, using box jumps as cardio. But in addition to the physical benefits, box jump exercises can also provide a mental challenge and help to improve coordination and balance. The act of jumping up on landing on a box, it requires a certain level of focus, of coordination, and this is going to help to improve those skills over time the more that you do that. And this can be especially beneficial for beginners who may struggle with coordination and balance in the first place. Uh, it's, it's important to note that box jump exercises can also present some challenges and potential drawbacks when people do them inappropriately, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, one potential issue is the risk of injury as improper technique or overuse can lead to strains and sprains and and dents out of your shins depending on what kind of box you're using it's important to start with a lower box height and gradually increase the height as your strength and your technique improve it also is important to um, to use proper form and technique including landing softly with no noise and bent at the knees this is to minimize the risk of impact and injury Another potential disadvantage of box jump exercises is that they can be very intimidating as they aren't one of the easiest plyometric exercises that you can do. Despite these potential drawbacks, box jump exercises can be such a valuable addition to any workout routine. 
with proper technique and form and gradual progression in box height, these exercises can provide numerous benefits to help to improve your strength, your power, your overall fitness levels, and your health. Improving your box jump performance is not only beneficial for your athleticism, but also for your overall health and longevity. So let's break down how you can get better at box jumps and why it matters. Number one, your technique matters. Start by ensuring that your jump technique is correct. Proper form reduces the risk of injury and maximizes your jump height. So here's the basic technique. Stand with your feet hip width apart, Bend your knees slightly and hinge your hips backwards. You're going to swing your arms back and then explode upwards, extending your hips and knees and ankles. So hips back, hands back. And then as you explode forward, your hands come forward and you launch yourself up. You land softly with your knees slightly bent to absorb the impact. How light can you land? How soft and quiet can you land? And then you want to step down off the box. Most of the injuries I see on box jumps are from people jumping backwards off the box. It's just not worth it. It adds impact. It's it's not safe. You could twist your ankle. It adds a bunch of impact to your joints. When you jump up on the box, you're you're diminishing the impact because you're landing at a higher level than when you started. But if you jump off the box, you're mitigating those, those benefits. Number two, plyometric training is so important. Box jumps are a type of plyometric exercise which helps develop power and fast twitch muscle fibers. The things that we lose as we age, because if you don't use it, you will lose it. Incorporating plyometric drills like jump squats, Squat jumps, tuck jumps, and hurdle jumps into your routine are going to help keep those fast twitch power muscle fibers. Strength training. Strengthening your legs, particularly your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your glutes. This is going to be essential for box jumps. So going into the gym and doing exercises that help strengthen your quads. So goblet squats, heel elevated feet close squats hamstrings, your RDLs, your deadlifts, glutes, your hip thrusts, your squats. This is going to be essential for helping increase your power when it comes to jumping. Is squatting directly correlated with better jumping? No, but it's going to help assist when you strengthen those muscles. Compound exercises, um, deadlifts, lunges, barbell back squats, even just goblet kettlebell squats work. This is going to help build the necessary strength for better jumping ability. Working on your speed and agility is important too. Box jumps require explosive speed. So practice agility drills. Sprinting up a hill adds another layer. Ladder drills help to enhance your speed and coordination. Um, Balance and core stability is a huge factor here. So maintaining balance practices, uh, doing single leg squats, doing lateral movements like lateral lunges. Um, these are going to be great ways to help increase your box jump. Core stability is also crucial for landing safely and effectively. So include things like planks, Russian twists, side planks, even like stability ball planks or stability ball knee tucks. Uh, all those should be added into your routine if you're looking for better box jump ability. And then just consistency and progression. Track your progress by recording your jump height and the number of repetitions that you do, and then gradually increase the height of the box once you become more comfortable at that height level. Recovery is important here because it's just like any other training modality. If I'm training for strength, I'm going to do some resistance training that breaks down the muscle, and then I'm going to give it the nutrition and the time needed to repair and rebuild. This is the same thing. Adequate rest and recovery are essential. Allow the muscles, the tendons, the joints to recover from the jump workout that you did to prevent any overuse injuries. So you're doing jumping exercises and jumping exercises tend to put a little bit more strain on the tendons, on the ligaments, on the joints. So they require a little bit more recovery time because those tissues don't have a lot of blood flow. So that would be mean that in, when you're doing strength training, you only do you do maybe three to four to five workouts per week. Some people do up to six to seven. Whereas jump workouts, I would maybe take that back to maybe one or two a week, depending on what your specific goals are, especially if you're new to jumping. 
Other things that you want to consider are not doing your plyometrics for cardio. So this is where a lot of the P90X and that thing goes wrong because you just are jumping around and you're trying to get your heart rate up. When you could do that in such a safer way, in such a lower impact way. So try not to do your jumping exercises for reps higher than 10. You're not going to be doing a box jump and then come back down. And you're not going to do box jumps for 60 seconds in a row because that is just that is unsafe cardio. A real plyometric jump, you should set yourself up. You should do a maximal effort, step down from your jump, and rest and recover fully. It might even take 15, 20, 30 seconds to recover from that jump, and then you do it again. Plyometrics should be done for maximal force production and power output. With long, long recoveries, I'm talking like five to 10 times more recovery than it took to actually perform the rep. That is how you get more powerful. That is how you become a better jumper. Uh, that is how you prevent injuries and you maximize the benefits of your plyometric training. Why does it matter? Why does box jumps matter for health and longevity? Well, it's going to increase your bone density, reducing the risk of osteoporosis. It's going to enhance your cardiovascular health and endurance. It'll boost your metabolism and aid in your weight management. It'll improve your balance and coordination, reducing the risk of falls as you age. It's going to maintain your joint health and mobility if you do it properly, which is going to prevent stiffness and aches and pains. And it's going to promote your overall functional fitness, helping you stay active and independent as you get older. So to get better at box jumps, focus on proper, proper technique, incorporate plyometrics and strength training into your weekly routine. Work on speed and agility, sprints up hills, doing fast stair climbers, uh, prioritizing balance and core stability in your workout routines as well. This not only enhances your athletic performance overall, but it's going to contribute to your long-term health and well-being by keeping those fast twitch power muscles. Remember, consistency and patience are key to progress in any athletic endeavor, and getting better at box jumps is the same. All right, let's move on to question number three, our nutrition question. Question number three. I recently found out my mom has the first stages of dementia. Are there foods I can eat to help possibly prevent this from happening to me as well? Oh, man, I'm really sorry to hear about your mom's diagnosis. I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. And I totally understand your concerns for your personal health. Um, the good news here is, is that there is definitely dietary choices that can help you and your mom that can help support brain health and potentially reduce the risk of you getting dementia and of her further decline. So we've done an episode on this before and um, we've talked all about brain boosting foods, things like fatty fish, salmon, mackerel, sardines. These are loaded with omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, these healthy fats are like brain fuel, supporting cognitive function and reducing the risk of cognitive decline. Aim for at least two servings of fatty fish per week. Leafy greens. Popeye was onto something when he had his spinach obsession. Leafy greens like spinach, kale, collard greens. These are rich in antioxidants and vitamin K, which are thought to slow cognitive decline. Berries. The superfood blueberries or strawberries and blackberries, raspberries, these are packed with antioxidants and fiber and, and things that are known as flavonoids. These compounds may help improve memory and protect the brain from oxidative stress. Nuts and seeds, almonds, walnuts, flax seeds, and chia seeds, these are a great source of vitamin E and healthy fats. They can help lower inflammation and support overall brain health. And then turmeric, this spice used by cultures all around the world, contains an active compound called curcumin, which has an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant property, which is believed to have potential benefits for brain health. Beans and legumes, these are excellent sources of fiber, which help regulate blood sugar levels. Stable blood sugar is crucial for maintaining your brain health. And lean proteins, chicken, turkey, lean beef, provide essential amino acids that are important for your brain function. Protein also helps maintain healthy neurotransmitters. Healthy fats such as olive oil and avocados contain monounsaturated fats, which can contribute to healthy blood flow to the brain and reduce the risk of cognitive decline. And dark chocolate, yes, 
You heard that right. Dark chocolate in a small moderation contains cacao flavonoids that may boost brain function. Choose at least 70% cacao, 75% cacao or more for maximum benefits. We do 95% at our house, one or two squares every night with some berries. Great, great way to get your sweet tooth and um, to have a nice little snack at night if you need it. Now, remember, it's not just about what you eat, but also how you eat. Portion control is so important. Overeating can lead to obesity, and obesity is going to increase the risk of conditions like diabetes, which are linked to cognitive decline. So keep those portions in check. Staying hydrated. Dehydration can affect your ability to concentrate and think clearly, drink plenty of water throughout the day, and maybe even add electrolytes if that's something that you think you might be deficient in or if you test yourself that you're deficient in. Mindful eating. Pay attention to what you eat and savor your meals. Know that this food that you're putting into your mouth is being broken down to become you. Mindful eating can help prevent overeating and it can help improve your digestion. Limit your processed, ultra, highly processed and palatable foods. Foods high in added sugars, get them out. Trans fats, those should already be out. And refined carbohydrates, these all can be de detrimental to your brain health. Try to minimize your consumption. Added sugars, trans fats, refined carbohydrates. Socialize and stay active too. Engaging in social activities could be a huge, huge factor here. Regular exercise is a huge factor here. These things can reduce the risk of cognitive decline. A healthy mind needs a healthy body. And then mental stimulation. Just like your muscles will atrophy if you don't use them, so will your brain. Keep your brain active with puzzles, games, reading, or learning new skills. Dr. Daniel Amen, who has the most brain scans in the world, says that paddle sports like ping pong or pickleball or tennis are great ways to keep your brain healthy for longevity. Mental exercise is just as important as physical exercise. It's just so important to remember that there's no magic pill or magical food that's going to guarantee the prevention of dementia, but just adopting a balanced diet rich in all of these brain boosting foods, along with the healthy lifestyle of all the things that we're talking about, all those things added together can put yourself in a great position to contribute to maintaining healthy cognitive function and overall well-being. I'm sending lots of love to your mom, to you, to all those people out there that are having either themselves or someone in their lives struggling with cognitive decline. It's a sad, sad thing, and its reality is getting worse, and and it's affecting more and more people. So something that we all should really be focusing on is, is making sure that we do what we can do to set ourselves up to be in a good position to prevent this as much as possible. So moving on from the questions to our recommendation of the week, we want to recommend again, it's getting close to game time, Sean Stevenson's new family cookbook, Eat Smarter Family Cookbook. In this Eat Smarter Family Cookbook, Sean expands on his best-selling Eat Smarter book with 100 delectable recipes with radically upgraded ingredients that are fit for the whole family. Inside this book, you're going to find recipes like sweet potato protein pancakes supreme salmon burgers, and avocado fries that offer a healthy and mouth-watering twist to old classics. Each easy-to-prepare recipe is designed with nutrient-dense ingredients that will transform your body from the inside out. This is going to come complete with sample meal plans, mind-blowing food facts, and tips to transform your family's kitchen. Eat Smarter Family Cookbook has all the recipes you'll need to upgrade your food choices and ultimately transform your health and the health of your entire family. And we here at the Live in the Dream podcast are going to be going through one recipe a week led by our amazing Jamie Martinez co-host. Jamie, what do you think? What are your thoughts on this group that we're putting together what are some things that people can expect? We have a ton of people from our gym, a ton of people from our social media. They're all wanting to join in on this. We're going to go through one recipe a week. I'm super excited. What can you tell them to expect when it comes to this group when that book launches and drops October 10th? 
Boom. Yes. I am super, super excited for this, you guys. This is going to be so much fun. So yes, hopefully we get that book on the 10th and then I will pick two recipes right off the bat. I'll announce it on the 10th when we do get our copy um, and I will give you a few days. I'll give you actually six. So the first week will start on the 16th. That is a Monday. Um, so I'll try to always let you guys know at least by that Friday before to give you a chance to get your grocery shopping in if you're someone that goes on the weekends. Um, but again, the 10th, I will announce the two recipes that we will start with. Week one will start on the 16th. Week two will start on the 23rd. So make that meal with your family. Uh, maybe you're just by yourself as well. Make it by yourself at any point that week. We would love it if you posted it, tagged us, let us know if you modified anything at all, how your family responded, people in your household, if you liked it, what you did, what you didn't. Um, and let's just have some fun. We'll post it and share our thoughts as well. Yeah. So stay up to date with us on our social medias. I had a DM conversation with Sean and Ann themselves. They are so excited that we're doing it. You're going to have uh, coaches from around San Diego that are in it as well, that are nutrition experts themselves. So a really great opportunity to learn about health, learn about nutrition, learn about how to make food the way that it used to be and, and not just um, something that you do while you're eating and watching TV. It's going to be a great way to connect with community. So we'd love to have you a part of it. I'm Coach Damien underscore SD and Jamie is J-A-M-E-E-M-A-R-I-E, -E -E, Jamie Marie. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. We'll post on our stories. We'll do some for real posts and all that stuff. So stay on the lookout for that. Super pumped. We'll start that October 10th. The first recipe will be the Monday after that. And we're going to leave you with an inspirational quote here about personal growth. Personal growth is the bridge that connects you to who you are today with the you who you can be tomorrow. As you build that bridge through self-improvement, you'll find yourself crossing into a future filled with unlimited possibilities. Your personal growth is like tending to a garden. It requires consistent care, nurturing, and just as a well-tended garden yields beautiful blooms, your dedication to self-improvement will yield a life filled with success, happiness, and fulfillment. I just have to give you props for being a lifelong learner, for staying with us all the way to the end, for being a part of the Living the Dream team. We are so grateful for you. Thank you for investing time in yourself. And we're excited for what the future has in store. Thanks for listening, team. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for listening and learning here with us on the Living the Dream podcast. We are so grateful for you being a part of this lifelong learning journey. If you have any topics you'd like to discuss, please let us know in the comments or by messaging me on Instagram at Coach Damien underscore SD. Be kind to someone today. Smile at someone today. And leave every person you come into contact with better than before. Until next time, friends, keep living the dream.